a dinner for a camas flower was created through a commission and an invitation from the Sun Valley Museum of Art. And they were having their anniversary exhibition, which was going to coincide with the Prairie Festival. And they asked that I would do something in relationship to the camas flower. And in fact, they took me on a retreat into the camas fields. So I went with a group of amazing people and dug camas. And I realized in the process of this activity that I was performing a set of gesture sequences that were very unfamiliar to me, but also something that had been done for thousands and thousands of years. And it was very humbling. And I also came to the conclusion that this lovely little purple flower was imbued with thousands of years of narrative and history and stories, none of which were really mine to tell. And the flower itself is very, it's very deeply connected to the indigenous nations of that particular area. In fact, really anywhere that camas grows, there's a connection to the tribes of that area. I thought, well, okay, this is a great starting off point, but these myths and stories and narratives that connect to this flower, while they are significant and important, they're not my stories to tell. The dinner for a camas flower has nothing really to do with the camas flower itself, but rather the flower stands in as an object that suggests that any object, like the camas flower, holds a world within itself. It has many different stories, many different narratives, and many different histories that connect to it. And I thought, well, if this humble flower has 11,000 years of history, I bet everybody has objects that tell stories. And so I used the camas flower as a way to kind of pivot to create a book that invited people to a dinner where they would bring an object and then share the story of that object and why it was significant and its histories and its narratives. And the dinner itself is based on themes. So whoever hosts the dinner would choose a theme. So for example, included in the invitation to the guests of the dinner was to choose a object that connected you to another person, to somebody and to bring that object and that during the dinner, you share the object with everybody at the dinner and tell the story that is connected to it. So the Camus book itself, while maybe it was connected originally to kind of the history of the Camus prairies, it was really just a starting off point to create a book that was about how objects and things that we have and surround us are deep with narrative. What was so interesting about activating Dinner for a Camas Flower is that it was a group of people that either didn't know each other or vaguely knew each other, but weren't necessarily close. And yet the dinner became very quickly, deeply intimate. And that all of the guests at that dinner, regardless of the kind of their, their knowledge of the other folks, received the stories with such grace and kindness and in a generative fashion that, you know, encouraged other conversations on family and life and the conditions in which we reside. And, you know, you never know with a group of people that are not fully familiar with each other how that's going to go. But I thought it was remarkably impressive how intimate the dinner became and how quickly that occurred in part because everybody was sharing rather intimate stories probably when he was in his just after college when creating the books each book kind of manifests in different ways and the process for choosing the texts and the design of the books aren't uh, linear by any means so in some cases the books kind of generate just out of previous research that I've done. So for example, in A Dinner for Getting Lost, I had a lot of the quotes that were in there 
song lyrics. They were all things I had written down that were already kind of placed within my sketchbook and my journal. So it was very easy to pull those things out. In other cases, the books come to fruition through a process of research, because I think that research enriches the language that resides within the texts of the books. And my hope with these books is that they kind of exist like a poem. So there's images, there's photographs, there's drawings, and there's text that I write. And then there's text that I pull from other authors. And that happens, it's different for each book. So some books like the Camus book in some ways initially needed a lot of research because I needed to understand on some level the depth of the narratives and histories that orbit that particular plant. To say that there's one process for all these books, it was probably not accurate, with the exception that on some level, they all demand some amount of research. And then it's like any other artwork in many ways, it's generative, that that language leads to drawings or to photographs. And um, in the case of the piece about remembering, involves actual photographs from an old photo album of mine. And the book itself is designed, it's a replica of a photo album my father had. So it's like, that's the things come together differently. And in the case of like a dinner for a joke, who doesn't like to laugh? Like in this time, or I should say in this moment in time, we all, we all need some catharsis. And that book was more driven by research than others. So they all, have different paths. And I think on a practical level, you know, the books are all hard bound, right? That's traditional binding. Each book, a plate is made for the cover. So for example, with the camas piece, you know, I drew a picture of a camas plant that was then converted to a metal plate, which was then used to emboss the book. And I use hardcover books because I want people to interact with them. And if I'm using a handmade book, they become which I started in the beginning using handmade pieces. They're just too fragile and they fall apart. And then if they feel too fragile, I fear that people won't want to pick them up and they won't want to engage. And then in many ways, their purpose is never really fulfilled.